Good morning, J.A. family. Hope you guys have had a uh, good week. I'm uh, missing you as I have, uh, of course, been away from you guys for uh, a week now. Lena and I are uh, just about over everything now. We're thankful for that, but thankful very much that we can uh, come together Sunday morning here uh, virtually and continue our study of the book of First Thessalonians. We'll be in First Thessalonians uh, chapter four, the very end of the book, end of the chapter, excuse me, and also into chapter five. Uh, and then next uh, next month, February, we'll go ahead and finish out First Thessalonians and probably go ahead and cover uh, Second Thessalonians and be hopeful and prayerful that we'll be uh, in, in a spot where we can uh, safely meet together again uh, to continue our studies of, of other books of God's word. We have finally made it. We finally made it to the part of First Thessalonians and, and the topic that's also covered in Second Thessalonians that really most people think about and wonder about when you think about the uh, books written to the Thessalonians the second coming of Christ. Uh, in every chapter of First and Second Thessalonians, it's been said this way anyway, in every chapter of First and Second Thessalonians, there is an, at least one allusion to the second coming of Christ. It is a big deal. It's the, uh, the main theme, the underlying theme, the central theme, if you will, of the book of First Thessalonians. And it is, I think, the reason, uh, the questions about it are the reason that Paul writes the book of Second Thessalonians. So we look at this and we consider, and of course, it's something that we would be interested in. These Thessalonian Christians who are much closer to the time of Christ are also uh, certainly interested in, in knowing when Jesus is going to be coming back. So we're going to, to look at this and, and consider this. You know, you think about it, and there have been many false prophets throughout the last several centuries, the last 2,000 years or so, that have cried wolf, that have said, uh, Jesus is coming back at this time, in this place, and, uh, and set your watches. And you know that some people have um, committed suicide because they believe that that was the best way to make that transition from the physical to the spiritual, uh, that many people have sold their possessions and, and uh, the approach of this coming day that they uh, were sure that Jesus was going to be coming back. Many have uh, led people astray from uh, the Bible, uh, certainly from Christianity, from mainline Christianity, uh, from, from all walks of life and, and, and their jobs and their families. Uh, because these people believe these false prophets who were crying wolf. Uh, and this has hurt uh, the legit legitimacy of Christianity. People have looked at and said, oh, you guys, y'all don't know anything. You, I thought Jesus was going to come back on this day, so-and-so. And people have been saying that for years. So it, it has hurt the, the legitimacy of Christianity. Anytime that, that Christians stand for things that are false, Anytime there are, that Christian stands for things that are not true and perpetuate things that are not true, it hurts the legitimacy of what we claim is true. Uh, that can be in our secular life. That can be in, in every aspect of our life. When we support things that we know aren't true, that are clearly not true, that clearly um, have been proven to not be true, uh, then that, that harms our uh, case for Christ and his deity and God and the Bible and, and our faith. Uh, but maybe even more importantly, maybe even worse, is that uh, all of these uh, false prophets who have cried wolf throughout the years have also harmed the vigilance of Christ followers, of you and me maybe. You see, the, the idea of uh, when Jesus is coming back cause shouldn't be so much of a let me make sure that I'm, I'm ready for it, though there is a part of that, or let me make sure that when I when that day finally gets here, then I can get my life right, or right before that day gets, gets here, I can get my life right. Instead, the idea is we're looking forward to that day. We're longing for that day. Uh, Paul says in one of his letters, Maranatha, oh, come Lord Jesus. That's uh, that come now. That's, that's, we are excited about the day, uh, the coming day of the Lord, the day when we will finally be in heaven with our God. Uh, and so the, the idea that these false prophets have perpetuated, uh, that we can, we can wait and we can prepare for that one day, that one time, which of course we know is contrary to scripture, and we'll study that a little bit today as well, uh, we can, we, we've lost the, the anticipation, the excitement about, we don't know when it will come, but I can't wait until it does come. And these Thessalonian Christians, they had some things. Paul wants them to know about uh, some things here and consider what's going on. So again, we think about and consider the context of, of the, the situation here. Why is Paul writing about this? This, you know, first, second Thessalonians is written because uh, the Thessalonian Christians have some questions about when Jesus is going to come back and if they had missed it. Um, but, but Paul here, he introduces it 
uh, probably because of the persecution that they're going under, uh, that they're, they're experiencing. Uh, and, and we can, as it says here, I think, um, one can imagine the possibility because of this persecution, because of this difficulty that they've gone through, because of losing jobs, because of capital punishment, perhaps even, uh, one can imagine uh, the possibility of a string of recent deaths or the question of the reality of a recently deceased leader in the church in Thessalonica. Uh, maybe there had been many members uh, recently who had passed away, maybe from old age, maybe from persecution, maybe from accidents, but but they were here and they're, they're not here anymore. They're, they're gone. They're, they're dead. Uh, and Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed about those who have fallen asleep. I want you to know. Or maybe it was a, an influential leader. You know, Paul and Barnabas aren't there anymore. Timothy's not there anymore. But uh, clearly some of the other Christians had stepped up and they had become uh, leaders of the church, leaders and, and uh, people who uh, other Christians could look up to. Uh, so maybe one of them had recently been uh, been been killed, uh, had died natural causes or, or any number of other reasons. But we can certainly because you and I have been in a situation like that where maybe many people at church have passed away for whatever reason it might have been. Maybe many people in our family or our friends have passed away. And when we, things like that happen, we have questions and we we know uh, Paul has taught them about these things, it seems, about what happens after this life. Uh, but he wants to reassure them perhaps let's read verses 13 through 18 of first thessalonians chapter 4 he says but we do not want you to be uninformed brethren about those who are asleep that's a, uh, an analogy or a, a description of those who have, who have died they're, they're dead physically so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope for if we believe that jesus christ that jesus died and rose again even so god will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in jesus for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Those, again, comfort one another. Don't grieve as those who have no hope. Clearly, there have been some who have died recently in Thessalonica. And Paul's concerned that, that they'll be hurting, that they'll be mourning, that they'll be mourning just like everybody else. And he wants to comfort them and he wants to provide continuing comfort. And, and don't you know, these words have been used so often at funerals of Christians uh, that we can we can know that one day we'll be with our Christian brethren who have long since passed again, those who have been influential in our lives, and maybe those who have brought us to Christ, or those who uh, were some of the, the first leaders of the congregation, or our elders, or preachers, or Bible class teachers, or parents, or grandparents, uh, and, and we can know that because of their obedience to the gospel of Christ, and our obedience to the gospel of Christ, and God's grace, and God's mercy, uh, that we can see them again one day, uh, and he tells us uh, to not to not grieve as those who have no hope. He tells us to not um, to, to comfort one another with these these facts really is what he's talking about and then he kind of walks through it a little bit of what what's that going to be like and i guess that's the question we all kind of wonder isn't it and the scripture doesn't give us a whole lot of details this is this here is is about as much a detail as we get there are a couple of other passages in 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 scripture that give us a little bit of an idea but but not much uh and and we'll talk more about that as we get towards the end of the lesson but let's look at first thessalonians chapter four uh, in verse 14, again, uh, again, he walks us through. Here's the reason. We don't talk about the reason for it already, but let's look at the um, the event. Remember, the reason he's talking about it is so that they can have comfort. But here's here's the event, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, okay, well, that's central. That's foundational to our faith. If we don't believe in the resurrection, uh, then we are uh, wasting our time, right? Uh, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Again, any effort to dissuade uh, our belief in the historical fact, the, the real idea that I believe and that you believe that Jesus Christ uh, resurrected from the dead, this only serves to take away from the hope of Christians, the hope that you and I have. Remember Romans 10, 9 and 10, uh, the, this part of salvation that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it is central, uh, again, to our faith that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And, and if we believe that, then we can believe that God will bring with him 
those who have fallen asleep. So what's going to happen to all those brethren in the last 2,000 years? Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who have died in their faith, who have died in Jesus. Well, when we're all gathered up together with God on the last day, on the judgment day, Jesus is going to bring those who are dead in him, in Christ, along with whoever else is alive and remaining. Uh, so there's there's the event. Here, here's, again, the process of it. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Okay, God is saying this. He's reiterating that. We know every every uh, uh, scripture uh, is, is inspired by God or God. Breathed. But here he says, by the word of the Lord, uh, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Uh, and let's read verse 16 and 17 as well. Uh, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. So here's here's the process. He's he, again kind of some some details of what it's going to be like. Uh, the Lord's going to show up. He's going to descend. Uh, the voice of a, with a shout. The voice of the archangel. Uh, the trumpet of God. And then it says, "Then the dead in Christ will rise first. Those spirits that are now waiting in the the Hadean realm uh, that are in Christ, they will uh, ascend into uh, the heavens where." Uh, Christ is, and then we who are alive and remain, who are still in our physical bodies at the second coming of Christ, together with them. I believe it's in uh, 1 Corinthians or it's in 2 Corinthians. I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I believe it's 1 Corinthians. It will be changed in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, that this perishable will put on the imperishable, this mortal will put on immortality. We're going to be changed. This physical will put on the spiritual. Uh, we'll be changed. Whoever's, whoever's here, if that's us, then it'll be us. If it's, you know, people generations from now it'll be them whenever jesus comes back uh those who are alive and remain those who are still physically alive will be changed in a moment the twinkling of an eye as they're caught up together with the lord in the sky and it says that we will be with him uh there we will always be with the lord we're going to be with god in heaven uh continually now now what's the what's the hope that that that's it right uh you know the, being in the presence of god very uh this is, this is a significant contrast when we think about the hope of Christianity. Um, what is the hope of Christianity? Why are you a Christian? Well, hopefully because you love God. Hopefully because you love Jesus. You recognize who he is and how much he deserves your adoration and your, uh, your obedience and your following. Uh, but all of us are, are followers of Jesus because we want to go where he is. We, we want to go to the Father. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. So we, we recognize that, that he is the way to get there. He's the way to, to get to heaven. That's the hope, right? The, the rest, the, the, the final rest, the Sabbath rest for God's people is, is now ultimately in, in heaven. And, and this would be very different than other first century um, religions of, of any variety, whether they be uh, Roman gods or Greek gods or Egyptian gods or Asian gods. Uh, even the Sadducees, the, the Jewish God, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in an afterlife. So it, it's foreign not only amongst other religions or other gods. It's it's foreign even to some of these Jews, the idea of, a, of an afterlife, of something coming beyond this. And, and and so there's very little mention of an afterlife. But but even in is what what is mentioned in some of those other religions, um, there's no glory to it. There's no there's no hope in it. Those uh those are the ones who have no hope. Don't grieve like those who have no hope. If Listen, if, if there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no heaven to look forward to and then no hell to avoid as, as, as much as possible, uh, then all there is is this life. And, and the call of Christianity is not about getting everything you can get in this life, is it? The call of Christianity is about being a servant. The call of Christianity is about giving up things for other people's good. The call of Christianity is about denying ourselves, picking up our cross daily and following after Jesus. So if there's not an afterlife, like so many of these, their religious friends in the first century, maybe our religious friends today believe that there's not, um, then they would think we were wasting our time. They would think we're missing out. They would think we're not being able to do that. And they'd be right if there's not. But we believe that there is. We believe there is a heaven. We know that there is a hell. And we're trying to uh, a heaven to, to gain heaven, to win heaven, and to, to shun and to avoid hell. We, we believe that because we believe what 
scripture teaches us. So this is the, the hope that we have. And we again, we can comfort one another with these words that, that, yes, the Thessalonian Christians, especially, they're going through trial. They're going through persecution. They're going through difficulty. Their life is not easy. Their life is not their life is not good. But there's something worth looking forward to. There's something worth continuing to try for. And that's what they're doing. And then First Thessalonians, sorry, First Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, verses 1 through 11 talks a little bit about the timing and here I want to I want to talk about this a little bit I want to read these verses and then I want to kind of walk through a, a little bit of these things and, and really maybe even give a little bit of a preference to our uh, our study of the the book of second Thessalonians uh, because the point that's made here is the most important point even in the book of second Thessalonians so stick with me and, and let's read this first uh, Thessalonians 5 1 through 11 now as to the times of the epics brethren When's this going to happen? Now is the when is this going to happen? Is basically what he's saying. Now it's now to the times of the epics, brethren. You have no need for anything to be written for you to you, for you yourselves know full well. Okay, these are new Christians, but Paul has addressed this issue with them prior to writing this letter. You yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come, just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep get do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the, and as a, as a helmet and the hope of salvation. Uh, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are also doing. Okay, so there he's talking about, you know, you guys, you're, you're aware of the, the timing, and that's something that, that they had to be thinking about. Maybe it was something that uh, Paul anticipated them thinking about. Okay, well, you've told us that our our, our brethren that are, are are passed away that they're uh, that they will see them again one day. Well, when is that going to happen? When's that going to happen? And he reminds them, seeming as to the time of the epochs, you have no one, you have no need of anyone to tell you because you yourselves know full well. You know this already. Paul clearly, and maybe Silas and Timothy or someone has has told them that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. You don't need me to tell you when it's going to be because you know that we don't know. And of course, that echoes what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, that it'll be like a thief in the night. And other way, other places, Jesus says that uh, he himself doesn't even know, but the, the God, the, the Father alone know these things. He says, while, while they, the, the world, everyone else is saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them. Now, that could, that could mean a lot of different things. Maybe that just means as far as, you know, people are, are, you know, things are just kind of normal. Things are kind of peaceful. Things are kind of easy. Things are are, are, are just, just standard. But also, this is a, uh, a, a little bit of a, a addressing uh, Rome's appeal, the, the, the appeal of the empire of Rome. Rome, on their coinage even, one thing that Rome promised to all of their subjects, even those who they conquered, was if you really want peace and safety, you're going to let us rule over you. If you really want to have a good life, you're going to let us roll over you. This is, again, tantamount to saying Jesus is Lord, which Christians all over the first century world got in trouble for and some some killed and many imprisoned. Uh, and, but, and, the, and the point is that could be made here is Paul is saying Rome can't offer you peace and safety. Only God can offer you peace and safety. One day, the destruction of the world is going to come. One day, the, the world is going to be destroyed completely. One day, this is all going to be over. But if you're in Jesus, there's peace and there is safety. Uh, you can't escape it. It's like childbirth. Uh, there's pain associated with childbirth. It's, it's unavoidable. Uh, if you do it the, the natural way, it's not going to, to, to happen without some sort of pain. And then he talks about darkness and light and this is this is interesting because he says we're not of the darkness we're, we're children of light we we walk in the light you know first john talks about that idea uh, but what, what is he talking about here i think what he's talking about here is we don't need to be surprised we, we don't need to 
uh, you know, if, if, if why I'm making this video, if, if the voice of the archangel and the shout and, and the trumpet goes off right now, I don't have to be surprised by that. Does that, does that get your heart pumping a little bit? What if right now in this moment, while you're watching this video, a big trumpet played and you heard the voice of the archangel, what would you think? Oh, oh no, not ready. What would you think? Oh yes, Jesus is here. What, 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 what would you think? Would you be surprised? Would you be scared? Would you be shocked? He says, there's no need for us to be surprised. There's no, no need for us to not be prepared. It reminds me again of the parable of the 10 virgins. They, they knew that the, the bridegroom was coming. They didn't know exactly when he was coming, but five of them were wise and they were prepared, even if it took longer than, than maybe they anticipated. And five of them were foolish. They knew he was coming, but all 10 of them knew he was coming. Some were prepared to, to stick it out for as long as they possibly could. And some were prepared to only stick it out for as long as their, their supplies lasted. They didn't bring any extra. Uh, we need to be ever vigilant, uh, not in fear, but again, in anticipation, knowing is knowing when is less important than being ready for whenever. Did you hear that? Knowing when Jesus is coming is less important than us being ready for whenever Jesus comes. Uh, you know, first Peter, I believe it is that uh, the Lord is not slow about his promise, but being patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God wants more people in heaven. Praise God. God, thank you for that. God wants more people in heaven. He's being patient because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. I don't know when God's going to come back. I don't know when Jesus is going to come back, but I trust that he is. And, and I want to be ready. I want to be ready at the, the end of my life. I want to be ready right this moment. And I've got, I, I, I got to do my best to, uh, to be prepared and to be following Jesus, living in rhythm with Jesus, uh, living like Jesus. Not that that's going to make me good enough, but following in Jesus the footsteps because again he's he's that way he's that truth he's that life so we're not in darkness so we'll be surprised the world's going to be surprised when Jesus comes back but we're not because we know the truth we're not because we're looking for him we're not because our eyes are to the skies we're not because we long for the day when Jesus comes back well how how is that going to happen what's that going to look like let's again read verses uh, 8 through 11 but since we're of the day Let's be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, for, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you're also doing. Brothers and sisters, Paul says this should encourage us. This should build us up one day. Let me tell you something. One day, Jesus is going to come back. One day, whether you're alive or whether you're dead, Jesus is going to come back. And if you're dead, you're going to beat people that are alive to see Jesus. And if you're alive, you're still going to get to see Jesus. One day, Jesus is coming back. And we got, must be ever ready, ever uh, vigilant for that, looking for him, longing for him, wanting him to be here. I know there's good things about life. I enjoy the blessings of life. I enjoy the material blessings of life. I enjoy the emotional blessings of life. I enjoy the relational blessings of life. I enjoy the church uh, here on this earth. But I long for the kingdom of God. I need to, to keep in the forefront of my mind. I need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. I need to seek him and his kingdom above all other things. Longing for that day when he will one day be back. We've got to have self-control. We've got to have faith and hope and love. Through Christ, and comfort and build one another up, just as we're still doing, and we need to excel still more. Second Corinthians, they're really going to need it. Uh, the the brethren in Second Corinthians, they're going to be some people. Again, we'll talk about this more in the coming weeks. But there'll be some people who said, "Oh, you missed Jesus. He came back already. Don't you know that?" And I, no doubt, there's some of these people who are maybe the the Jewish enemies of Christians, maybe the Gentile enemies of Christians. But oh, yeah, I know you were waiting on Jesus. He already came. You you missed him. I. I'm sorry to tell you that. I imagine there were some really, really mean people who were trying to harm the cause of Christ uh, by telling brothers and sisters that. And they're really concerned. They're really worried uh, that they've, they've missed it. They've got some other questions, too. Uh, and, and we hear about the son of desolation and the apostasy. And, and there's all kinds of like, whoa, those, I, don't, I don't know exactly what that is. I don't know exactly what that means. What should I look for here? What should I look for there? Can I, can I tell you something? Well, again, we're going to talk about that. And. And I'm going to study it, and I hope you will study it, and, 
and maybe we'll come to a better understanding of who the uh, the, the son of desolation is and exactly what the apostasy is and whether that's happened, whether that's not, all these things. We'll, we'll look at that. But, but can I tell you the most important thing from 2 Thessalonians is in 1 Thessalonians? Be ready. Be ready all the time. Knowing when is less important than being ready whenever Jesus comes back. So just be ready. Just be ready for Jesus to come back. And when he comes back, be someone who he will call to himself and you will gather to him in the sky and there you will be with the Lord forever. Why is it important for Christians? Why is it important for us to regularly think about the second coming of Christ? Out of sight, out of mind, out of mind, out of heart, out of heart, out of life. We got to think about why we're living this life, not just to go to heaven to avoid hell, but to be with God as he loved us and gave his son so that we would not have to spend eternity in hell. Uh, brothers and sisters, I, I long for the day when uh, we get to go to heaven. Maranatha, oh Lord, come. And I hope you do too. Brothers and sisters, I hope you have a good day. I look forward to seeing you soon.